that we have found a new home for the poetry calendar. I am just I'm thrilled. Uh, so a couple of announcements before we uh, begin the second half. Uh, first of all, uh, Malvern, meticulous archivists that they are, uh, would like all of the poets to sign their copy for you know their wonderful records of Austin poetry. So please, before you leave today, please come up here and sign your poem. Uh, and there is a fancy pen here. Don't steal it. It's my favorite pen. <laughs> my favorite pen that I take out of the house. Okay. Um, the other thing is that, uh, again, at the end of the reading, please assemble outside under the fancy, beautiful uh, marquee so everyone can all squeeze in real close and friendly like, and we can have a whole picture from the whole reading, again, for, you know, Malvern's excellent records. Um, so I'm very excited about that. So we'll take the second half group photo. And then we can all pour out into the freezing cold and have our picture taken, and it'll be super fun. And then you can find more books. All right, so uh, moving on. Uh, Chip Dameron from Brownsville. Where is he? Chip? Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, he's the author of a travel book and several, seven collections of poetry, including two published in 2015, Waiting <coughs> for an Etcher from Lamar University Press, and Drinking from the River, New and Selected Poems, 1975 to 2015, from Wings Press. His poems, as well as his essays on contemporary writers, have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies in the US and abroad. He is a two-time nominee for the Pushcart Prize and a member of the Texas Institute of Letters, and his poem is found on the September Overview. Thank you very much. Before I begin reading, I have to make a confession. I happen to be one of the brothers who quit playing marbles and went next door to play Risk. <laughs> Some of you may remember my sister's poem about that. <laughs> uh, the poem that's in the uh, current Texas poetry calendar is called South Texas Communion. While the Pope was tour touring DC and shaking hands with the nervous <coughs> chosen school children, I watched a vermilion flycatcher as it poised on a willow branch, black masked but too orangey red to pass for received doctrine, and swallows zoomed around on their mosquito orbits, quicker than prayer, leaving it up to the gaudy green jays in the oak tree to talk about what it might mean to behold the halo of light after the afternoon's soft rain. I've got a poem about highways, uh, but uh, a little different uh, take than, uh, than the one Marcella read earlier. And this is called Road Trip, Nixon to Kennedy, 34 miles. You know, I live in South Texas, and I've gone back and forth from there to, to Austin and on to Dallas a number of times. And uh, when you're, uh, if, if, you, if, you're, if, you want, if you're leaving uh, Austin, you want to avoid the interstate. Uh, to head further south, you can take uh, um, back roads and head down through Lockhart and Luling and so forth and end up going through Kennedy, Nixon and Kennedy and those two names you know, have <laughs> an interesting historical connection. And so at any rate, road trip, Nixon to Kennedy, 34 miles. Fine driving in April, scissor tails back on telephone wires, bright coral swaths of Indian paintbrush along the roadside, Mesquites boasting their chartreuse vigor. Nixon comes and goes quickly, one mile square of pickups beside modest homes and Mustang Stadium, big enough to hold 2,200 on football Fridays. <laughs> Halfway along, new caliche roads lead to dozens of fracking operations, fat cylindrical storage tanks, skinny towers flaring burn-off gases, saltwater disposal wells threatening the groundwater. Disinterested cows graze the fields. <coughs> Kennedy has more bustle, though many shops along its three block downtown are shuttered. The action's on Highway 181. The town holds a blue bonnet festival each spring, I missed it, and was called 100 years ago Six Shooter Junction. Nixon has two ends, but Kennedy is short one, named for Mifflin and not John F. I was at Love Field when Kennedy flew in, waited for his return until the terminal announcement rode home in numbness. 
Eleven years later, visiting a friend in D.C., I watched Nixon's televised retreat to his California sunset. Hero and villain, martyr and crook, though labels never tell the whole story, for both have the blood of 50,000 soldiers on their gravestones, separated by the breadth of a continent evoked by two obscure Texas neighbors. <laughs> A few years ago, I had an opportunity to travel in China, and uh, we spent, uh, uh, as part of that travel, I spent several days uh, going down the Yangtze River, a beautiful river uh, in China. And, um, uh, and so after, afterwards, I, I wrote this poem, and I'm, I have a reference here, many of you may be familiar with, but uh, 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 reference to uh, the uh, great Chinese poet who now is called Li Bai, but used to be called Li Po. Uh, that's how I knew him uh, back uh, when I was going through school, but they've changed a lot of the names, and uh, he's now called Li Bai. He, was, uh, he, uh, he lived and wrote uh, 1,300 years ago, but his stuff is uh, awfully fresh. At any rate, um, it's called Drifting Down the Yangtze River. Last night, as we passed the lights of houseboats docked along the bank, the way dark as a carp's gullet and humming with cold harmonies, I looked hard for Lee Bai and his lantern <coughs> floating mid-river, waiting for the moon to emerge from the clouds, waiting for me to climb aboard with a bottle of Jew so we could tell each other poems in our own disparate tongues, laughs bouncing off the rumpled hillsides and waking up the authorities, those tiresome skulls who have forgotten the night songs their parents once sang. Thank you. Next, I'd like to bring up Barbara Gregg from Austin. She has published in Diverse City, Blue Hole, Wing Beats, and several editions of the Texas Poetry Calendar. And as Wade and I have gone through and worked on the best of, it is really amazing to see how many times some people uh, have appeared. It's uh, pretty incredible. And she's one of those poets. You'll find her poem the week of September 3rd. I will say, this has not been my best poetry year. I've had a hard time writing for much of it. And so that's why all that I have in the poetry calendar is a haiku. Cricket uh, uh, proudly serenades his love and me at 2 a.m. <laughs> Cricket proudly serenades his love and me at 2 a.m. And you know, that's based on reality. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first poem is, uh, starts off talking about, it's called Commitments. But it starts off talking about cold fronts and snow. Somebody said to me when I read it to them, what are you doing talking about snow? You live in Austin, you don't even see snow. So just pretend, you know, it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Some cold fronts leave small snow mounds everywhere. On morning walks, I can see white patches reached by beetles unexpectedly covered by a flurry. Like a spit of snow on my shoulders, a spot of unnoticed commitments lands on my doorstep. Slightly spoken yeses, just a dusting, a crew unrealized, and quietly the work piles up. Soon, I must seek a sanctuary free of commitment before these unanticipated time drifts smother me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other one, this is called Early Morning Hunts, and it is about hunting. I worked for Parks and Wildlife for 20 some odd years, and although I worked for the fisheries division, I knew a lot of hunters, a lot of my friends, both men and women, were hunters. And so I probably have a different perspective than some people do. 
So this is called Early Morning Hunts. A field lay beyond cedar posts that leaned left or right, broken or fallen, steadying wires gone. Low, wispy clouds glued to the ground, spread whirls of light blowing through the fence. We walked slowly with Dad and the dogs, shotguns at the ready, while pastures dewy oat seeds doused our boots and our jeans. For years, we walked, hunted dove, found solitude, and ate fried bologna sandwiches before heartburn-filled nights. <laughs> Best, though, was slipping <coughs> quietly into low talk around the campfire about anything, everything. The only rule we swore to carry secrets heard that night to our graves. Turned out that was a hard promise. Part of what was said sometimes just couldn't be forgotten. Somehow the truth of it got infused into our lives, for good or not. Mm -hmm. Next, I'd like to bring up another Austin poet, uh, Claire Vogel Camargo. Uh, she has recent work in World Haiku Review, Cattails, Deepwater Literary Journal, and Lifting the Sky, Southwestern Haiku and Haiga, as well as her lovely chapbook, Iris Opening. Hmm. Woohoo! Thank you. I have my uh, haiku is opposite. Uh, the end of September, across from September 29th and 30th. Wraiths waltz amongst the cedar, hill country mist. Wraiths waltz amongst the cedar, hill country mist. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy I was able to get into this. <laughs> Last, those got to the, the issue here. Um, I forgot to bring another poem, and uh, Amy Greenspan kindly lent me her blue hole uh, that came out this year in Georgetown Poetry Festival, and I do have a poem in there, uh, which uh, was published in uh, September of this year, the Art of Peace uh, Tyler Chapbook Anthology. The, theme was to write, uh, the title is Paths to Peace, Journey to Wholeness, the theme being peace. Peace is a plant. Maybe peace can begin with a plant. The gift of one planted in the ground or potted, can it be that simple? The peace lily my brother and sister-in-law had delivered to me after my return home from the hospital, end of January 2015, still grows new leaves and blooms soothes the heart agitated back then into atrial fibrillation, mm. still makes me feel cared for. They could not come. I notice miles and lack of physical closeness can engender feelings of emotional distance, real or imagined, create fertile ground for misunderstanding, turmoil. Hard to feel peaceful without a sense of well-being. Watering peace lily alongside our ficus a heartwarm, a heartwarm, housewarming and heartwarming, gift to us 32 years ago relaxes me. Ficus grows wild in our dining room, untrained. I know water and light are important, add gentle touches, words of thanks, am happy I've kept them thriving, family ties too. Sharing peace can be as simple as planting caring. Mm -hmm. Time I can read someone else's poem. You can read poems. Absolutely. Don't have to, but I'll read another from the Texas Poetry Calendar. Uh, Loretta Diane Walker, mm -hmm. uh, who lives in Odessa. Would you like to make a comment about her? Um, uh, Loretta could not be here today, so I'm very happy that Claire will be reading her poem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she's a, a wonderful poet and uh, comes from my neck of the woods. The title is Of Death and Water. It is opposite the total November calendar in the book. 
Odessa yawns with 300 days of sunshine spilling from its dusty mouth. This November morning is plucked from the 65 count sunless skybox. I open my back door to find a leaky faucet and the wind with its coarse hands resurrecting dead leaves. They ascend, reach for the balcony. Too heavy for air to hold, they fall into the burial ground of my backyard. Startled by my breath's protest against the cold, my neighbor's gray cat rushes across the open sepulcher. A faint crush, crunch teases my ears. How gentle the sound of death against paws and fur. How curious the way darkness pines for light. How it wants to step out of its atomless body, live in the clouds of electrons. How this dripping faucet wants to be the Rio Grande with its voice of stone and water singing across borders. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I haven't seen Margot Davis, and she does not appear to be here.